So is this the most common technical error in climbing? And if I just do that, did I just fix it? In this video, I'm gonna try and answer that question. For over 10 years or so, I've thought that that is possibly the most common technical error that I see in climbers. It's routinely made by beginners and also intermediate climbers who are actually quite experienced. And although it's less frequent, it's still also made by quite a number of elite level climbers that, that I see. The great thing about this error is how easy it is to fix just by moving this left foot here. And I think that once you're aware of what the error is and what that foot should be doing for you, then you'll probably do it a lot less. So as you're probably guessing by now, this error relates to the counterbalancing foot, often the foot that's not actually on a foothold. And perhaps that's why it's so forgotten and almost never talked about by either climbers trying climbs or by coaches teaching climbing. When I coach climbing myself, I find that it's one of the most obvious errors to spot in many climbers. And when you point it out, you can often help climbers to succeed on moves that they've been failing on just a moment ago. So hopefully I've made a case for why this counterbalancing foot is so important. And although it's very misunderstood, it does a massively important job. But is it just as simple as doing this? Not really. So in the rest of this video, I'm going to explain what I think the counterbalancing foot should be doing for you in different types of climbing moves. And I think that if some of you start to notice this on a regular basis, then your climbing style might change for the better straight away. Okay, so I think the simplest place to start is to break down a very simple move and show you what the counterbalancing foot should really be doing for you to make moves easier and to make you need to use less power on a given move. So I'm gonna do one simple move between these two black holes and this black hold up here. Now this is part of a normal boulder problem, which I'll actually come on to in a second. But for the sake of demonstrating this, I'm going to use this one red foothold here. So let's say that I was doing this boulder problem with red footholds. And so I was doing this. So just for this one move, I've got the right foot on there. The counterbalancing foot is out to the left. Now even the word counterbalancing foot makes you think that it's just about achieving balance. And that is one of the job, but that's actually, I think probably the least important job that it does. And so to try and show you how it actually takes weight off your arms, I'm going to deliberately do the common error. Now the common error is for, right, the right foot's here, and I just put my left foot out here. The common error is to put the, the counterbalancing foot too low and too close to your center of gravity, your center line. So, to show you, if I put my foot there, which is too low and too close to my center line running up here, and then try and do the move. Can you hear <laughs> the change in my tone of voice? So often when you're at a climbing wall, uh, you'll hear people trying moves and you'll overhear people say, my core doesn't have enough strength for this move, or that's a core intensive move. And that may be true, but it may also be that you're actually just making this error, or at least it's contributing to the problem. Of course, having a strong core and being able to apply strength to your whole body is important for climbing, and, and it's good to train the, that physical aspect. But core strength, strength in inverted commas, when applied in climbing, also has a technical element, which is, a, is at least as important, if not more important, than the actual strength element. In so much as the strength will only give you any leverage if it is actually applied with technique. <laughs> and so the reason I had so much tension in um, my voice there as I was trying to talk at the same time as execute the move was because I was having to um, rotate to extend my right shoulder here by using the rotator cuff and all of the muscles stabilizing my shoulder. I'll just do it again to show you. So in order to reach the hold, I need to get, I can't reach it at the moment, so I need to pull up. But if, if I pull straight up, well, for one, my knee's kind of in the way. Uh, even if I turn my knee in, if I lock my arm and then try and talk at the same time as take a hand off, I've barely even got the strength to do it. Now this is an easy move. It shouldn't take anywhere near this much strength to actually do it. So 
what I'm going to try and do is twist my whole trunk so I'm facing to the left and then I can reach it with a lot less power. But you can still hear, hopefully, you can still hear the change in my tone of voice because of the power that I'm having to use. I'm slightly hit breath just from doing that one move. Okay, so if I do the move correctly, and I tr again, I talk as I'm doing the move, hopefully you'll hear the difference in my tone of voice. So now I'm gonna put the counterbalancing foot in the correct place, and I can actually climb the move back and forward, back and forward, and really doing the move is now no harder than just hanging the position with two hands. So that's the difference. If you get that counterbalancing foot in the right place, that's the only thing I changed. So what is that counterbalancing foot actually doing? So there are three components of what this counterbalancing foot has to do. A moment ago, I was talking about how people talk about moves being core intensive and requiring a lot of core strength. And the, what you're doing instead of using core strength in your upper body to control the movements and do things like twist and reach, you're using the length of your limb, your big lever arm on the end of your, your body here, and at the end of that, that counterbalancing foot. So it has to be as far as possible, but not too far from your core in order to maximize that leverage. And again, often the error is for climbers to have it too low and uh, too close to the center of gravity. It needs to be a little bit higher, but not too high, and it needs to be far enough out, but not too far. The reason it has to be not too far away from you is because as you actually do the move and reach for the hold, which I'll show you in a second, if it's too far away and the foot slides across the wall as you make the move, you tend to lose the tension with it. And what you'll find that as you become aware of the placement of your counterbalancing foot, you will gradually instinctively know where to put it. There's no instruction that works on every move that I can tell you. It's just something that you have to learn over time. Now, probably the most misunderstood thing about the counterbalancing foot is which direction to actually push with it. Often people, especially beginners, will try to use the wall as a foothold, which if you're on a slab, may actually even work a little bit, but on an overhanging wall, especially a smooth one like this, it really won't work. If you try to stand on the wall like it's a foothold and push, push in that direction, your foot will slide and you'll lose all tension and often you'll actually lose your balance and, and fall off the move. So the direction of push with the toe should be directly into the wall with quite a lot of pressure. And what that does is as that left leg pushes, that forces the right side of my body to, into the wall and allows me to reach with that shoulder. Obviously on this small foothold, I'm trying to get as much tension on that as I do the move. And as I move my center of gravity up away from this hold, you know, if I just push up away from the foothold, I'm getting further away from it and then it's going to lift off. So I, I need something to oppose against that. And that counterbalancing foot pushing up into the wall allows me to get a pose opposing forces, opposition between these two points and it actually allows me to get even more tension on that foot without needing another foothold to do so. With this foot, <coughs> I'm pushing and pulling at the same time. I'll maybe talk about this in another video about what feet sh should be doing on footholds. But on, on this foothold, I'm trying to push down on it in order to push my body away from it. I'm also trying to pull it out the way in this direction. So this foot's pushing that way, this foot's pulling that way. I'm trying to imagine I'm trying to rip that foothold directly out of the wall. With this foot, I'm going to really bite my toes into that foothold. I'm imagining I'm trying to pull it out of the wall. But as soon as I press in the way with that foot, I can really pull in even more with that. And you can see that when I get the hold, my leg is just about straight and my toes pointed. So if it was further away, it would slide. <laughs> and as it slides, I would lose the tension. Now on that little version that I just created of that move, the foothold that I was using was almost in the center line of below the actual handhold I was doing the move off. But on the actual real boulder problem here with black footholds, it's slightly different. I'll just show you that now. <laughs> so if I'm doing this boulder problem for real, I've actually got this foothold here. And then for this next move, now the geometry of the move is quite different. So that's the hold I'm moving off, but instead of my foothold being 
in the, the same line as the handhold, it's off to the right, so that the move itself is a lot more front on to the rock. Although I still do roll around to extend that shoulder. So this is quite different. Did you see that the counterbalancing foot is now much more underneath me? That foothold is out to the right, and it's also because it's quite a good foothold. I can really claw in and actually pull in with my hamstring very hard on that foothold and get a lot of power with it. So I don't need the counterbalancing foot to be as far out to the left. I actually only really need it to be, well, it can't be too far right either. It has to be just about there, but it has to be uh, not too high wants to be as low as it can be to provide a lot of leverage, but not too low that, again that it slides. So if I try and do the move without using it at all, just like this, then I have to really, <laughs> again, like the amount of strength I have to use to do that move is amazing. It's actually amazing how just pushing your foot into the wall makes such a difference. So what that does is if I just stand off balance here and push that foot into the wall like that, I'm really using the front of my thigh to hold myself in such that if I were to let go, I'd fall backwards. So as I'm doing the move, when I push inwards with that foot, it's levering my upper body into the wall and allowing me to reach the hold. So hopefully the basics of the technique are clear enough. And um, there's one more aspect, which I think is a source of error in climbers techniques. Um, and this is across the board from beginner through to actually elite level. I have made an observation that many of the technically best climbers that I've ever seen who have climbed the highest grades for their strength level, they are the climbers who impress me the most, I must say. Um, and they almost universally have something in common, which is that they are very active with their lower body. In other words, they try as hard with their lower body um, as they do with their fingers and their arms. So they will pull into, claw into footholds, push with that counterbalancing foot and be really aggressive with their lower body. You can see the tension being created and then released from move to move. This is actually quite difficult to come across in a video. It's easier to see if you actually see someone climbing in the flesh. And so I've often found that when I've been bouldering with really good boulders who are technically excellent, um, often it can be some of the best female climbers in the world, but not universally. Um, they often tend to be very good at making the most of their lower body and uh, really using the strength that they have there. But just in order to illustrate this, I'm actually going to go from my warm-up problems on uh, my steep board here to one of the hardest problems on the board that I've done. There's a problem here on orange holds, which uh, I've had up on my board for a long time. And <laughs> I haven't actually done it for a long time. I've only done it a handful of times ever. I don't think I'm even going to try the whole climb today. I'm just going to try the crux move, which involves going from two side pulls kind of in an iron cross position. But there's one high foothold for my right foot. And then you have to do this big kind of drive by move for a side pull. But the counterbalancing foot, it has to be in the exact right spot and you have to consciously push into the wall with it through the whole move. So I'm just going to try that now and I'll almost certainly just fall off a bunch of times. Um, and I reckon I probably have the strength to do it. And probably if I practiced it enough, I probably could do the move again. And what I've been gaining from the practice is learning to push in with that left foot and that's where the progress would come from. So I'm just going to try it. well I was able to do that move. So as I say this technique is something that once you're aware of it you tend to build it into your climbing naturally. That's how it worked out for me. I began to point this out to other climbers as I started to coach them and as I started to do that I noticed that more and more in my own climbing 
and I noticed that I was being just a little bit too passive with my lower body, not using the power that I have in the large muscles in my lower body to give maximum leverage. And I sometimes was making that little error of the foot not being out far enough out to the side or too low. So this has to be one of the easiest fixes in climbing technique that's out there. And it's also something that's really easy to drill. You know, you can do this as part of your warm up, especially on climbing wall routes where they're often big and juggy and you have a big foothold for one foot and you have uh, the counterbalancing foot off to the side and you can think about the positioning and the strength that you, you push with it. But also when you're working hard boulder problems, that's why I wanted to demonstrate that on a hard boulder to show that I am thinking about this when I'm working moves, it is something that's on my mind all the time. So I hope this video was useful to you and I will make some more videos on other aspects of climbing technique and training and if you have any questions about those then please do leave me them in the comments and do remember to subscribe to my channel if you haven't done already. Okay, see you in the next episode.